Lucius Ramos from the IMPA. And this is the title of his talk, Integrable Systems and Symplectic Embedding. So he's, um, he's an outsider a little bit in this, uh, in this seminar, and we're very happy to expand our vision of uh, <laughs> geometry to include also this uh, symplectic uh, um, vision. So thanks for accepting our invitation. And, uh, and um, so it, now it's, it's uh, your time to present our, your talk. OK, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Paulo, and um, thank you, and Hiki, for the invitation. Um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you, uh, to to speak to you, uh, and hopefully one day, not too long, we can be reunited uh, somewhere in South America and um, see each other and discuss in person. But for the time being, I'll try to tell you some of um, my, about my research, and I'll try to start from the beginning and uh, try not to say too many technical things. Um, hopefully it'll be interesting and we can um, we can potentially uh, I don't know even find points of commonality I'm sure we, we can if we try uh, I also want to say that uh, small disclaimer which is I put my computer in full screen so if there are any comments on the chat I can't see them uh, until probably like the very end so if you have a question um, please interrupt um, and you know just talk uh, you can unmute yourself and talk I think that'd be easier. Um, I, I just can't see you while I do the full screen. Um, uh, yes, we'll, we'll do that. We normally interrupt. And okay. I'm just illustrating how we do it. And uh, okay. just, just so people know, that you, you're going to find the usual instructions on the chat to join the what our WhatsApp announcements group, the uh, calendar of upcoming talks and previously recorded talks uh, on our YouTube channel. Cheers. Go ahead. Oh, great. All right. So let's start from uh, classical mechanics. Uh, I, I assume that many of you, maybe most of you, don't know what symplectic geometry is about. So I'll start from the very beginning. Um, so I think everybody's familiar with Newton's uh, equation uh, for, for movement from classical mechanics. So um, the momentum, the, the derivative of the momentum is a force. And the force is usually thought of, I think, most systems, it's the gradient, minus the gradient of some potential. So depending on the particular problem, you have to figure out what the potential is. But the equation is this. Um, that's you know, Newton. And then without mentioning Lagrange, uh, just skipping to the 19th century, Hamilton uh, basically reformulated it. And now in modern language, it's pretty easy to just write down. Um, you, you basically just call P the momentum. And then he uh, this equation from Newton gets translated into a system of ODEs of first order. So, I mean, now you have uh, two N equations, uh, but it's a first order ODE. Um, that's just as I wrote. Uh, and you can write down this, this function H, which is called the Hamiltonian, which is basically the total energy. So the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Uh, and you can see that you can actually write this equation, this ODE, just in terms of partial derivatives of H. Uh, so it, you could kind of try to play the same game uh, for other functions h. And one thing I want to say here that you probably already know from physics is that the this the flow of this differential equation preserves the Hamiltonian. So you know basically total energy is preserved. That's dates back to Newton, but if you write it like this, it's pretty clear. Uh, it's a very simple calculation that shows that the flow of this ODE preserves your function h. So now we could try to play this game as usually as mathematicians, we get inspiration from physics and then we kind of forget the physical intuition and we just try to play with, with the symbols. Is, did anyone want to say something? I think somebody has their mic on. Ah, Alejandro okay. has left his uh, microphone turned on, I think. Oh, okay. That's okay. Alejandro, could you please turn off your... Okay, so um, let me just give a quick uh, overview of what Hamiltonian dynamics is about. So the idea is basically to try to do the same for uh, another smooth function. So let's look at uh, R2n, uh, where we think of it as divided in two parts, so Q and P, uh, and take a smooth function. And you can actually play the same game. So you can consider the, the vector field, which is dh dp, 
minus the HDQ, and you can look for its flow. Uh, so you can notice that this vector field is just uh, j times the gradient, uh, where j is this. It's basically like the the minus i multiplication by minus i um, in this. If you see r two n and c n, and it's pretty easy to check that the the flow of x h is preserved by h. So this is called you know we could this is usually called a Hamiltonian vector field. You can think of it as a symplectic gradient. So it, it, it relates to the gradient very easily, but instead of increasing the, the value of the function, it actually preserves the value of the function. Uh, so the flow of xh preserves h. Uh, and basically understanding orbits of this uh, is, under, understanding the dynamics of this vector field is what's called Hamiltonian dynamics. And that's a very important subfield of symplectic geometry. So let me just uh, say how this actually gave rise to symplectic geometry. So you can write down this uh, two form omega, which uh, eats two vectors v and w and spits out the inner product of v and j w, uh, and it's easy to check that it's a closed non degenerate two form. So the metric is non degenerate, but it's uh, not an alternating form. Uh, but this thing actually becomes alternating because of j, because j squared is minus the identity, and it also is a closed uh, form. Actually, you can write it down like this. So omega is the, in terms of exterior products. OK? Um, and so basically, the, this omega, the, this xh is, is what the gradient is. But instead of using the metric, is you use this omega. Okay, And then you can talk about basically having forms like that on any manifold. But I actually don't, it's already quite interesting to talk about R2n. And so I'm, I'm going to just. Uh, do everything for R to N with this standard, with this omega here, the standard symplectic form. But it's a very interesting thing to look at other manifolds with uh, closed non-degenerate two forms. That's called symplectic geometry. Um, but let me talk about like a very specific part of symplectic topology, but which is already quite interesting. So um, say so given two subsets of R to N, here's a question. It's a classification question. Does there exist a, a diffeomorphism uh, that preserves this two-form omega. So um, here's an example of one such uh, diffeomorphism. So if you're in R2, then your omega is just the area, the standard area form in R2. And if you take the unit disk, it's not hard to see that this is going to be uh, symplectically equivalent or symplectomorphic to the interior of an ellipse uh, where the parameters are uh, inverses of each other. So that, that the diffeomorphism is very easy. You just multiply one coordinate by a, and you divide the other coordinate by a. And because the symplectic form is dq1, dp1, uh, this preserves uh, the symplectic form. OK, so this is you know, the, the most basic uh, symplectic diffeomorphism, which we call symplectomorphism. But this question, as many classification questions are in geometry and topology, it turns out to be quite, quite hard. So instead of looking at classifying uh, even sub-manifolds of R2n, we're going to look at a simpler question, which is the embedding question. So given two subsets of R2n, does there exist an embedding from one into the other that preserves the symplectic form? OK, so this is already, this is a little bit easier, uh, but it's already hard enough, and there are a lot of really interesting, surprising results. So if it exists, we'll write it like this. We'll say that x1 symplectically embeds into x2. and uh, there, I, you know, I often put an S on top. I might forget here and there, but uh, all my embeddings from now on will be symplectic. So, so if x1 I, if and I, x2 are not necessarily open sets? Not necessarily, no. A lot of the times they will be, but... So, so in, and also, you know, I, I'm not really interested in the topological obstructions for embeddings. Uh, you know, there, there will be, uh, obviously, but, you know, basically the question is, like, when there exists a topological embedding, does there also exist a symplectic embedding? Um, as you'll see in the examples, the examples actually, most of the cases I'll consider are very simple from a topological perspective. Uh, whether they're open or not, they won't be, uh, if they're not open, they will be uh, the closure of an open set. There will be pretty simple sets, um, as you'll see. So uh, you can notice also that if you take the wedge uh, power of omega n times, that is n factorial times the standard volume form in R2n. Um, so that means that if you preserve omega, then you preserve the volume form. 
So that means that a symplectic embedding uh, is a volume preserving embedding. It preserves the total volume, but in particular, it has to pres it preserves even the volume form at every point. Um, so you know, ba basically, the question now is: given a, a volume preserving embedding, is it also a symplectic embedding, or can you find another symplectic embedding of the same um, domains? And if you play around with um, two dimensional sets, like a subsets of R of R two, it's a pretty standard argument. I mean, it basically a, vo a symplectic form is a vol is a is the volume form is the area form. So there's nothing interesting in, in two dimensions. Symplectic embeddings are just area preserving embeddings. Uh, and in higher dimensions, it wasn't really known until 1985, this very uh, seminal work of Gromov. So let me tell you about that. So let's define the ball of radius r to be this. Uh, and this is the cylinder of radius r. So my cylinder is a, is a disk in the variables q1, p1, and all the other variables are left. Uh, and this is the, the product of a two ball with r2 and minus 2. Uh, so the question is, can you embed a ball into a cylinder? So I mean, obviously, if the radius of the cylinder is bigger than the radius of the ball, the ball is a subset of the cylinder. But what if the radius of the cylinder is smaller than the radius of the ball? Can you embed a ball into a cylinder? And it's not so hard to see that you can do that in a volume-preserving way. Uh, so you can you can actually can squeeze um, the, the, the ball into the cylinder in a way. I mean, you, you don't have a, a volume, a total volume obstruction, but it's possible to do it such that the volume form is preserved at every point. Uh, that's a, not a very hard construction. But what Gromov proved in 1985 is that you cannot do that symplectically. So in other words, uh, there only exists an embedding from the ball of radius r into the cylinder of radius big R if the radius of the ball is less than or equal to the radius of the cylinder. I mean, one direction is trivial. So the, the, the really interesting direction is the, is the implication from left to right. Um, <clears throat> and it was, a, it's a, it was a really important paper. Uh, and also, I mean, it, it's a, it was a completely new result. And also it introduced pseudo-holomorphic curves into symplectic geometry. So basically, that's when symplectic geometry got more connected to uh, algebraic geometry and even analysis because of all the methods that were involved in proving existence of, of these uh, pseudo-holomorphic curves. I won't get into that, but uh, here's Gromov. And another way to see this is to think, about it, to think of it in terms of symplectic shades. So if you take your ball and you project it to a two-dimensional plane, or, you know, the, the Q1, P1 plane, then it has area pi r squared uh, it has it has diameter two r, and when you project it, uh, when you apply symplectic transformation to it, and when you project it, the diameter cannot be uh, reduced. Uh, so the area also cannot be reduced. The the area of the disk that uh, fits it cannot be reduced. So that's uh, another way to see it. And this is kind of a cousin of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, I don't think it's really. I mean, it's not really a consequence. I don't think that you can rigorously prove that they're related, but it's a similar phenomenon for those who, who know more physics than me. Um, you know, you probably are aware of this, this principle in physics that says you cannot, if you have a very precise measurement of the position and the momentum, you can't measure it with the same precision. So there's kind of like the product of the two is bounded below by some, some constant. So it, it's related to this, but I don't, it, it's not really a consequence, but it, it at least has the same smell. Um, okay, but here's a, I want to just show you why this is really subtle. So if you, for example, if you look at the cylinder, which is not, instead of fixing, uh, bounding the coordinates Q1, P1, you bound Q1, Q2. If you put Q1, Q2 in a ball, now you can actually uh, embed any ball of radius R into this cylinder uh, where you fix the coordinates Q1, Q2. Um, so you see how like sensitive this result is to the actual setting that we have. So if you change the domain a little bit, if you consider this d z tilde, then the result is completely false and you have total flexibility. And the reason is because uh, if you don't fix p1 and p2, if you, if you just fix q1, q2, you can actually do this, a similar symplectic transformation that I showed you earlier for, this, for the disk in dimension two. You can multiply 
uh, you can divide Q1 and Q2 by epsilon, and you multiply P1 and P2 by epsilon. Uh, but because it's infinite in P1, P2, then they're, they're, they're symplectically equivalent. So any cylinder of this form, Z tilde, is symplectically equivalent to another one. So you can, you might, this is symplectically equivalent to just the cylinder of radius R, and the ball fits there. So um, I think it's interesting. To, yeah, and you know, remember that, and, and part of the reason is because in the symplectic form, or the main reason, you pair up Q1 with P1, Q2 with P2. So the, the, the variables are not equivalent. The, the, you can't just permute the variables. There is a, there's a distinction between momentum and position variables, basically. OK, so uh, let me say about a few words about symplectic capacity. Symplectic capacity is a function that uh, is a quantitative way to think about the symplectic embedding. So it will actually give an obstruction to symplectic embedding. So it, it's a, let me show you the two, the two properties. Uh, so it, it, it's a function. It's a function that satisfies this second property, which is that if you have an embedding, a symplectic embedding, then c of x one will be less than or equal to c of x two. So it's it provides an obstruction for embeddings, and then the first property just says that it's a two dimensional invariant. So without the first property, you could take the volume, for example, and the volume would be is a, an obstruction to symplectic. The, the, the total volume is a, is an obstruction, but it usually it won't satisfy the first property unless you're in dimension two. So this is saying that even in higher dimensions, I want the this function c to scale with r squared. So it really is a two-dimensional uh, object, so, which is a, kind of a core idea in symplectic geometry. You look at higher dimensional manifolds, but it's still the, the, the thing that you want to preserve is the two-dimensional, uh, it's a two-form. Uh, and then we have some non-triviality conditions. Uh, so we, as, we assume the capacity of the ball uh, is bigger than zero, and the capacity of the cylinder is less than inf infin infinity. That's another reason why it can't be the volume. Um, and then we say that it's normalized if the capacity of the ball is equal to the capacity of the cylinder, which is pi r squared. And notice that the existence of non-normalized capacity is equivalent to Gromov's non-squeezing theorem. So just to show that it exists, like such as a function c exists, is extremely hard. Uh, it's equivalent to Gromov's non-squeezing. So the area of some two-dimensional projection of the object wouldn't work? No, it doesn't work. It, I mean, yeah, first it depends on which projection. Like if you project to Q1, P1, it's very different from projecting to Q1, Q2. Yeah. Um, but that, that doesn't work. That doesn't preserve the second property, uh, for example. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. And this, it doesn't work also because like this cylinder you would have to choose which Q1, Q2 to project to. Uh, so say, say you project it, sorry, Q1, P1. If you project to Q1, P1, and then you take your cylinder, one simple transformation you can do is you can change Q1, P1 by Q2, P2. So you can change the index, and that will clearly be a symplectic transformation. But then now you're, you're projecting your cylinder to basically Q2, P2, and then that's infinite. Okay. So you see, like, if you, if you fix one plane to project that that's not preserved by symplectic transformations. Yep. yep. And uh, a consequence of the second property is that the capacity is a symplectic invariant. So like if two things are, if two subsets are symplectomorphic, then their capacities are equal because you can embed one into the other and the other into the one. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so here's a list of the simplest capacities. Um, so this, the Grum of width, uh, which basically is, just comes from Gromov's paper, is and is the inspiration of the definition of capacities. Just take the largest r squared, or you know, we like to put a pi there, pi r squared, such that uh, the ball of radius r symplectically embeds into x. So it's it's a consequence of Gromov's non-squeezing that this CGR is a capacity. Uh, and then you can do kind of the opposite, which is to look at the smallest cylinder that uh, a, a subset a set embeds into. That's called the cylindrical capacity. And it's easy to check that if C is a normalized capacity, then it's always in between those two. Um, so here are some other examples of normalized capacities. And I'll put the date so you can see. Uh, there is a kind of a gap in constructions, uh, uh, as you'll see. So the f one of the first ones was the Eklund-Hofer capacities. And the first one, C1, is a normalized capacity. And this is built using quite a bit of analysis. 
uh, Fred Home theory and you know some pretty hard analysis, and then with slightly different te anal analytical techniques and actually a little bit easier, you can define the hofford zander capacity. Um, and then there is another one also from '94 called the flora hofer capacity. I'm just going to list them, um, but then there's a huge gap. And then, like in the, basically, there are a few capacities that were considered, but nothing that could actually be calculated. Um, but then in the 2010s, um, a couple more capacities were defined. So this uh, Good and Hutchings in 2018 defined the first. S1 equivariant symplectic homology capacity, which is a capacity that uses a lot more theory. It, it's not hard analysis from the 80s, but it uses what's called flora theory and these pseudo-holomorphic invariants that are much more modern than that. But it turns out that it's, so it's a lot harder to define, but it's a lot easier to compute. Um, and they, anyway, they were inspired by the first Eklund-Hofer capacity. And Hutchings defined in 2011 a capacity that I, uh, have used a lot using something called ECH, uh, only in dimension four. Um, so here are some other examples of capacities. And I'm going to go kind of quickly. I'm just kind of listing, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why these are important, at least some of them. So uh, Eklund Hofer defined a sequence of capacities, which are not um, normalized, but um, they actually have been extremely useful, even though they were only computed for like two sets, two kinds of sets. Like, they defined them and they computed them for the ellipsoids and polydisks. And already with that computation, those computations, you could prove a lot of interesting things and a lot of symplectic embeddings exist or don't exist. Um, and then Good and Hutchings in 2018 proved, uh, constructed a similar, similar sequence using much uh, very different techniques, more, more modern techniques. And it turns out their capacities are much more computable. And Hutchings also defined by himself, another sequence of capacities just in mention four using this thing called ECH. Uh, and the, the well, the first theorem I just wanted to mention is that uh, Gut and I finally were able to prove that the capacities that Gut defined with Hutchings are equal to the um, Eklund Hofer capacities. Uh, they're kind of the traditional capacities. Um, so, yeah. But one interesting. Um, the uh, open question in the field is called the, the turbo conjecture. So let me tell you um, quickly what that is. So it's not a hard ex exercise to show that the Gromov capacity, so the, the smallest ball, the largest ball that embeds into a set, satisfies this property. So if you take that to the n and divide by n factorial, this is always less than or equal to the volume of x. That's just a calculation that follows from computing the volume of a ball. Okay, so if a ball embeds into x, then there is a volume obstruction. The volume of the ball is less than or equal to the volume of x. And then if you compute the volume of, of the ball uh, in R2n, uh, and you take the, the pi r squared into consideration, you basically get this formula. This is a simple exercise. Uh, yeah, so the idea, and you can do that if you are bored. Um, but Viterbo conjectured that this property holds for every normalized cap symplectic capacity, and he had reasons for that. Um, he had lots of examples. Like he played around with his examples of capacities and another one that I, I didn't mention. And that's the one open conjecture. Um, so let me tell you, uh, oh, moreover, equality holds if and only if x is symplectomorphic to a ball. So now I just I want to tell you one consequence of this, this, result, this conjecture. If this conjecture is true, um, well, before that, sorry, let me just say that uh, yeah, let, let me, sorry, let me, let me uh, do this slide first. Um, so one of the, these, these capacities, a lot of times have to do with actions of orbits uh, on the boundary of the manifold. So um, in something, I haven't defined the capacities, but let me just mention that if you have a compact and convex set in R2N with smooth boundary, uh, you can look at what's called a Rabe orbit. So that's just uh, the orbit of the characteristic flow. So if you have, I think it's somewhat standard, even outside of symplectic geometry, but if you have never heard of it, if you have your, your symplectic form, your omega, it's non-degenerate. But when you look at a hypersurface, then it has a kernel, and it's a one-dimensional kernel. So it, it, the kernel gives a foliation or a, a vector field, if you want. Uh, so you can look at the, the the closed orbits of that vector field. It's not even clear that that has a closed orbit. That that was a hard theorem, 
Um, but it's true in R2N. Um, if you take a compact convex set with a small with a condition called contact, um, then you can always prove that there is a closed uh, orbit. But anyway, if you can, you can take the shortest period of that orbit, uh, and a bunch of people uh, in different work, uh, different papers, they proved that a bunch of normalized capacities are all equal to the minimum action. So the Eklund-Hofer, the hofer zender uh, this flower hofer symplectic homology, and the good hutchings capacity, those are always uh, equal to uh, the minimal action. So, you know, based on that, uh, you can kind of have this weaker version of the Viterbo conjectures that not all capacities, but just the minimum action for a compact and convex set satisfies this property. And even this weaker capacity, this weaker conjecture is still open. And then you can also go kind of the stronger capacity, which is that actually all normalized capacities coincide, they're, they're equal. And all these conjectures are open and, and there are no, you know, obviously no counter examples to them. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, I think it's most people believe that all capacities, all normalized capacities should coincide, but proving that it seems to be very hard. Um, so, yeah, yeah but, but, you know, even proving the, yeah, the, the, the middle one um, is, is quite interesting. Oh, even the weak one is extremely interesting. Okay. So now I want to tell you one reason why this conjecture, the turbo conjecture, is, is quite interesting. And you might have heard of, uh, this is kind of a famous conjecture in convex geometry. Uh, it's called the Mahler conjecture. And it's actually very simple. It says, you know, take a centrally symmetric, uh, centrally symmetric just means that if x is in the set, then minus x is also in the set. Um, a set that's compact and convex in, our, in Rn then it has a, a dual set. Uh, so if you just if you think of this compact set as being uh, the the unit ball in some norm or in yeah in, in some norm, then you can take the dual norm and that the the unit ball in the dual dual norm is the dual set. So the 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 conjecture says that the volume of the of k times the volume of the dual is bounded below by this nice uh, constant. So this has been open for a long time. And it's proven in dimension for in R2. And I think it's proven in some cases um, in R3. But, but anyway, the other thing is that this equality is attained if and only if K is a Hahner polytope. Hahner polytope is like a very simple kind of polytope. Uh, it's basically a polytope uh, where you take, uh, it, it's, it's a set of polytopes generated by taking, uh, you, you start with, a, with an interval and you just take a Cartesian products and duals. So the, the set of polytopes generated by these two operations, that's called the Hanner polytope um, or Hanner. And uh, a very beautiful paper of Einstein, Avidan, Karasev, and Ostrover show that the weak Viterbo conjecture implies the Mahler conjecture. So if we know the, the weak Viterbo conjecture, then we will have proven this well-known um, convex uh, this well-known conjecture in convex geometry. And the main idea is to actually compute the minimum action for this uh, domain, k times k um, dual. So here's actually a domain that you see the boundary is not even smooth. Uh, it's compact and, and convex, but the boundary is not smooth, but we can still compute capacities for these things. Um, it's actually, you know, just take a, a, you just take a limit of smooth things. And they computed that this Hofer zander capacity is equal to four. Um, yeah, so here's just a little thing about the, the capacity, the, the what uh, the, the the series of implications like strong Viterbo implies the turbo implies weak Viterbo implies Mahler, uh, and of course Mahler already is quite interesting. So um, that's one of the motivations for studying capacities and trying to prove the Viterbo con conjecture. Excuse me, yeah. Vinicius. Yeah. When were these conjectures formulated? A good. I think the Mahler conjecture is several decades old, old. I can't remember the date exactly. Uh, the Viterbo conjecture is from the 90s. 90s. Uh, I think the Mahler is a lot older. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember the, I think in the maybe the mid 20th century, maybe even the early 20th century. So, sorry, I should have looked up the, the, the date, but. Okay, thank yeah, you. It, it's, it's old. Right. Okay, so um, let me, 
to, yeah, tell you this uh, really quickly. Oh, and uh, let me also say that these capacity, that these conjectures are all uh, for a normalized ca normalized capacities on convex sets. So not if you're not a convex set, then these you know we don't talk about these capacities. There are counterexamples to equality of capacities for non-convex sets. But I want to tell you a little like a step in the direction of proving um, th these capacity, uh, th th these uh, the weak for turbo and the strong for turbo capac uh, conjectures um, from last year. So uh, one thing that is easy to see is that convexity is not a symplectic notion. Uh, if you take a convex set and you apply a symplectic transformation, in general, the result will not be convex. But Hofer, Vizotsky, and Zender, they introduced a notion that is an invariant, uh, a symplectic invariant, and it's called dynamical convexity. So I'm just going to say what it is. Um, you know, if you have a, what's called a contact form in S2N, it's dynamically convex if the closed ray orbits, so these are the closed characteristics, have Conley Zander index at least n, n plus 1. And Conley Zander index, I, I don't have, to have time to define it, but it's basically like a Morse index. So it's something that can be computed. Um, so, in, and what they proved is that if, if you're a compact set, then you look at the standard, you know, primitive level form, then it will be dynamically convex. Uh, and until very recently, until last year, until December of 2020, it wasn't known if dynamical convexity was equivalent to convexity or not. But there was an amazing paper by Chaitas and Edmeyer that, that where they proved that it's actually possible to construct uh, dynamically, I forgot to say dynamically convex. So it's possible to construct a dynamically convex contact form, which is not the boundary of a convex domain up to simple ectomorphism. Okay, so um, sorry, I'm trying to say a lot of things, but uh, maybe uh, just take, take this as like an exposition of uh, many different topics. Um, so anyway, one very important uh, type of domain is what's called a toric domain. So it's a domain in CN that uh, is preserved by the standard Hamiltonian toric action. So one way to see it is the following way. You, you can consider this map that takes Z1 through Zn to pi times the norm of z1 squared and pi times the norm of zn squared. You can forget the pi if you want, but it's usually there for normalization purposes. This is called the standard moment map or momentum map. Um, and so here, like two examples, the cylinder. Uh, it, yeah, so the cylinder is given like this uh, and the ellipsoid is, is basically the, the pre-image of this um, triangle, okay? So, uh, and of course you can write a bunch of interesting subsets of uh, the first quadrant of Rn, and then you have uh, a domain. And, you know, it, it's very, there are a lot, of set, a lot of them, but it's still somewhat of a restricted class. But interestingly enough, it's very hard to construct uh, interesting subsets that are not of that form. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna call monotone domain, a uh, domain that looks like this. So it, it has, uh, it's the, the region that's bounded by the coordinate axes and the graph of a, uh, of a monotone function. Oh, yeah. Sorry, the, the, yeah, the graph of a, mon of a, yeah, a monotone function in every direction. Okay. Uh, monotone domains are not necessarily convex. And one interesting property is that a, a toric domain is monotone if and only if the boundary is dynamically convex. So the, the, there is a relationship between uh, being monotone and being dynamically convex. Uh, if you if you were toric, but see that this uh, maybe maybe if you're not familiar with it, you, you might think that this disproves that that question of whether dynamical convexity is equivalent to convexity. But this does not because. Um, even though you have monotone torque domains that are not convex, they could potentially be symplectomorphic to a convex set. So that's, um, that's what you don't know. But what we proved uh, with, with Gut and Hutchings last year is that a monotone, for, for monotone toric domains in R4, the strong Viterbo conjecture holds. So all, all symplectic capacities coincide. Uh, and in higher dimensions, we can't prove they all coincide, but we can prove that the minimum action coincides with the Gromov width. So this, the minimum action is the smallest capacity. There, there's a chance that there could be something in between that 
and the largest capacity, which is the cylindrical capacity, but um, we can prove kind of a weaker result in higher dimensions. And this is actually very common in symplectic geometry. Dimension four tends to be where a lot of techniques work that don't work in higher dimensions. So you tend to get results, uh, a lot more results in dimension four, or a lot more things are known in dimension four, um, unlike in smooth topology. <laughs> OK, so now I want to shift gears a little bit and tell you about integrable systems, which was actually the title of the talk. Um, so don't worry, I'm not going to get too deep into the techniques. Um, but um, I, I want to tell you basically a source of other domains that are not toric domains. But to, to say that, uh, I can actually admit, maybe I'll, no, I, I will just quickly go through the slide. So this is the ellipsoid that I defined earlier. And uh, ECH capacities are a sequence you know, of capacities that were defined just in dimension four. And it doesn't really matter what they are, but uh, they have a very explicit uh, formula. It's like a number theoretical formula. Um, and, uh, and the polydisc is also a, a quite, it's the next step. And by the way, as I told you briefly before, the, these old capacities from Eklund and Hofer from 89, they were only computed for ellipsoids and polydisks, and it was already quite revolutionary. So these two um, manifolds are very simple, but they are already quite quite interesting. Um, so uh, these ECH capacities actually turn out to be very interesting because um, so we say that they are sharp if they actually uh, imply that a symplectic embedding exists. So every capacity is an obstruction to a symplectic embedding. But it's not so easy to prove the other the other way around. So it, they're usually not. In, this is not true in general. But sometimes, for a symplectic embedding problem, you have the other inequality, which is that if the capacities if the capacity doesn't provide an obstruction, then the embedding exists. So this is what I'm going to say that it means to be sharp. And Dusa McDuff proved that ECH capacities are sharp for embeddings of ellipsoids. Uh, Franco and Muller proved that they are sharp for embedding ellipsoids and polydisks. And then Christopher Gardner um, recently, somewhat recently proved that they are sharp for a large class of embeddings, namely to embed concave toric domains into convex toric domains. So with those results, basically, that, that tells you that if you understand the ECH capacities, then you understand a lot of embedding toric domains. Not everything. Like if you switch like convex into concave, you know, there are still some open questions, but the, there's a huge machinery for understanding toric domains. So that's great, but that kind of makes us think, okay, what about things that are not toric domains? So what's beyond the toric domain? So here's you know, my favorite next example, um, which is the, the Lagrangian bi-disc. So this looks like a polydisc. You know, it's the product of two disks. So look at this, this set. Uh, and if you got a little lost, if I spoke a little fast, maybe uh, you can come back now because it I'm going to talk about slightly different things. Uh, so let's look at this uh, this by disk and note that this is different from the symplectic uh, the the, the polydisk that I had before. So the polydisk that I had before it was the product of two disks, but I I control the norm of z1 and then the norm of z2. And here I want to control the norm of q1 q2 and the norm of p1 p2. So like I'm it's two different disks. Uh, and basically, this is like a, a the, the Q1, Q2 is a Lagrangian subspace, and P1, P2 is a Lagrangian subspace. That's why it's called a Lagrangian by disk. So um, one thing, you, one reason why this domain is really interesting is the following. So, as I told you, capacities are often related to the characteristic flow in the boundary. So that's just the the kernel of the of the symplectic form. So let's look at that. It's and it's the same. Uh, you know, it's the Hamiltonian vector field for a level surface for for, for a, a for a for a function whose level surface is the boundary so if you want to compute the characteristic flow what you can do is you can look at the function that gives the boundary of the by disk so that would be the l infinity norm of the of the absolute value of q1 q2 absolute value of p1 p2 and you look at the gradient of that and you multiply by j uh, so you get this characteristic flow. So it's pi ddqi and then minus qi ddpi. It's a simple calculation. And the cool thing is, like you know, we can now try to follow this flow. So let's see what happens when you follow this flow. 
So first, ask you, can I ask yeah. you an intuitive question just to prepare? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you like it or dislike it when uh, you have um, periodic orbits of the red field on boundary? So you always have periodic orbits of the red field on the boundary. Okay. Uh, that's uh, a fear. I mean, if you if the boundary is a contact has this contact condition, which will be true for every star shaped domain, then you have con you have. But this, uh, I think you'll see why I like it in in at the end of the slide. Um, okay. Yeah. I just want to. Yeah. Suppose, because here, here your boundary is, is, is not sophisticated, right? So, so you, you have a circle component there along which your vector field is pointing and it's kind of clear. Yeah. What if, yeah. if, if the boundary, but do you particularly like it, for instance, if the boundary is an actual circle vibration? Yeah. If the boundary Regular. is more complicated, it, it's, it's very interesting too. I mean, any, I mean, even if you look at the general star shaped domains for any boundary, you know, even smooth. That can be extremely hard and interesting, okay. uh, but I think what's nice about this case, uh, you'll see why why I like this. And, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so let's try to follow this flow uh, and see what happens. So uh, basically, this I'm I'm just doing schematically uh, the product of two disks. I mean, the boundary is really like the union of two solid tori that are glued together uh, along uh, a, a, so, a torus, and the, you know this is this has corners. Um, this manifold has corners, so the, the boundary is not smooth. But it doesn't matter. I'm going to kind of ignore the, the corners, and I'm just going to think of it as a unit of two solid tori. Uh, and like at, the, at these corners, I'll just kind of ignore. Like the, the, the vector field points into the corner, and then it kind of comes out the other way. Um, it's just a technicality to look at the corners. But anyway, so on the first, uh, so schematically, I'm, I'm drawing my two disks. And then either I'm on the boundary of one and in the interior of the other, or vice versa. So let's start with um, when I'm on the boundary. Oh no, sorry. I, I, I ah, there's always typos when you give slide talks. Um, the, the, the P and the Q are switched here. So I'm supposed to have the Q on the on the left and the P on the right. I apologize. So what happens on the first uh, solid torus is that you're on the boundary of the circle of the disk in P, and then you're in the interior of the the disk in Q. And what is the characteristic flow? What is, what is this vector field? It's saying that you're supposed to flow uh, Q in the direction of P. And you're supposed to leave P uh, where it is. So there is no component DDP and just DDQ. So you fix the P here on the right. And then on the left, you flow uh, Q in the direction of P. OK, so I have to go in this direction. And then until I hit the boundary. So when I hit the boundary, I'm on this corner, on this S1 times S1. And then I just kind of go to the other solid torus. So now I go to the other solid torus, which means now I have to follow the, vec the, the vector field minus uh, QIDDPI. So that means that I am supposed to fix the Q on the left, and I'm supposed to flow the P uh, in the direction of minus Q. So this is what I did. And then I go back to the first one, and then I do this. I flow. Uh, Q in the direction of P, and I leave P fixed. And you can notice that uh, the blue angles here are the same, and then the red angles are the same. So if uh, on the right side I have a disk, then that means that on the left side, the trajectory that I see here is the trajectory of billiards in a disk. And actually vice versa. So if I have a disk on both sides, I'm going to have two different billiard trajectories. Uh, and what Artstein Avedon, Karazev, and Ostrov approved is that the Hofer Zander capacity of this is four. Um, so the minimum action is four. Uh, and then it's not hard to see that there is an explicit symplectic embedding of the ball of capacity four into d2 times d2. So you can actually comp compute the Gromov width. So all actually, you know, in this case, all of the uh, of the closed trajectories of this vector field are going to be are going to correspond to billiards. And their symplectic lengths or periods are exactly the, the billiard length. So this four here, the significance of this four is that really it's the, the shortest billiard. It's the billiard, it's the, it's the length of the billiard that goes through the origin of the disk. So we just, you just go once and you come back. That's one, two, three, four. OK. Uh, so in 2017, I actually was able to prove to compute embeddings from the bi-disk into balls and ellipsoids. Uh, and I proved that you know if you take 
the by disk embeds into a ball, if and only if the radius of the ball, the capacity of the ball is at least three root square root of three. Uh, and also I computed that for ellipsoids. And you see that these numbers, uh, they're, they're related to billiards. Like four, as I told you, is the shortest billiard. And three square root of three is the next billiard. Is basically the equilateral triangle inscribed into the disk. Um, and let me quickly talk about the proof because that's going to get into the integrable systems, which is the really um, what I what I wanted to the, the 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 main last point of my of the talk. So the the I think the part of of the proof that was really new was to observe that this symplectic by disk is symplectomorphic to a toric domain. Uh, and it tend, it's actually what's called a concave toric domain. So that was the, the, the really new part. And then the second step is to use the ECH machinery to actually construct it, a symplectic embedding using ball packings. And I'm not going to go into that. Um, but I, I want to concentrate on step one. So before I go into the proof, let me tell you other uh, consequences of this idea. So what are other toric domains in this guise? Um, so th the first one is the Lagrangian by disk, which I mentioned to you. Uh, and then last year, um, we, uh, you, Ostrover and I realized that we can extend this technique to the forming Lagrangian by disks, and they're all toric domains. So if you take the LP sum of two disks, uh, that's also symplectomorphic to a toric domain. Um, I also proved with Daniela Seppe from UFI that uh, a, a result in higher dimensions, but with a slight different class of domains. Like if you take a hypercube in a symmetric region in R2N, that's also a toric domain. Uh, and my new favorite thing now, <laughs> which is uh, if you actually look at the regular simplex and a region that has the same symmetry as the simplex in Rn, that's also a symplectic, uh, it, it's also a toric domain. I mean, these results all seem very similar. And the technique is similar, but everyone is actually kind of difficult, uh, or it's it's a new thing in its own. Uh, and it has to do with, all of this actually has to do with the integrability of billiards um, in the system, as, as you see uh, in, the next, in the next few slides. And then recently, I also proved with my student, Brian Fajera, that um, the, if, you, if you look at the disk bundle of S2, uh, and if you remove a point, that's actually a symplectic polydisc. And if you look at the, the disk bundle of a hemisphere, that's a symplectic ball. Um, and that has consequences for uh, symplectic embeddings too. So let me tell you what the techniques are to prove uh, what the technique, the main technique is to prove all these results. Uh, so it is what's called the Arnold Leville theorem. You know, basically it's a theorem that people attribute to Leville but Arnold wrote it nicely in his book uh, in the 70s. And it's the following thing. So consider a symplectic manifold. You can think of it as a subset of R2n, or if you know um, symplectic manifolds in general. And then you take n functions, uh, which uh, Poisson commute. So that means that their flows commute with each other. Like you take the Lie bracket of two of Hamiltonian vector fields, that's zero. That's the same thing as saying the Poisson bracket is zero of any two. And we need a couple of assumptions. So uh, the first, yeah, the main assumption is that C, if, if, you, if you take a regular value of this function H, of this function F, which is putting all the Hamiltonians together, such that the pre-image is compact and connected, then it's actually going to be a torus. Uh, so it's diffeomorphic to a torus. And moreover, you can do that locally. So actually, even more than locally, if you take a simply connected open set of regular points. Uh, and you know that, uh, and if one of them is compact and connected, then um, basically by continuity, the, they're all going to be compact and connected. Uh, and if, if you now find a, so, so they're all going to be tori, so you're going to actually have a topologically a, fiber, uh, a trivial uh, fiber bundle. Um, but actually now if you take a set of generating curves, uh, for the homology, for the first homology, uh, and you suppose, and you take a primitive of lambda, then you can write this function uh, phi, and then you have this really nice thing. So it's not only you, uh, it's not only a trivial fiber, uh, tr trivial fiber bundle, but it's actually a symplectically trivial fiber bundle. So 
there is a symplectomorphism from, from the set U to a product of the torus with the, the image of phi such that this nice diagram commutes. So basically what this is saying is that U is a toric, is a piece of a toric manifold. Or I mean, it's a toric manifold itself. Um, so there's this, this, this diagram like that. So basically, if you're trying to prove something historic, um, one, one way is to find these n um, functions that Poisson commute. Uh, and then you have to find systems of closed curves, which can be a little hard. And that's actually one of the hardest things that I've in, found in all these problems. But then you, you, you solve some integrals, which sometimes are hard. Uh, and then you get these beautiful toric domains. So let me tell you how this works in action. So this is the, this is what you do for the bi disk. So the idea is basically you take two Hamiltonians. One often, you know, the first one is just you know, take the connect, the kinetic energy that's gonna just just, just going to generate the standard movement. But then because you are in a disk, you can't just go forever. You, you we put this potential so that it actually is the billiard uh, thing. So like as you as you approach the disk, it actually is going to have a sharp turn and stay within the disk as you, as you approach the boundary of the disk. Uh, and then you find a uh, Hamiltonian that commutes with it. In this case, it's pretty easy. It's just a standard angular momentum. Um, but then you apply the, the game, and then actually turns out that it's going to be symplectomorphic to a toric domain uh, with a somewhat complicated formula, but it turns out that it's concave. Uh, so this is a, an interesting, very interesting calculation. Um, if, you're inter if you would like to know more about that, I can tell you at the end. Uh, but here's another one that, um, uh, another another application of that idea that I, I really like. This is, uh, we're still writing this up. It's not in the archive yet. But basically, if you take the, the product of the triangle or a simplex in higher dimensions with a sufficiently symmetric region, but for example, if you take the, in this case, if you take the triangle times the regular hexagon, you actually get a ball. Uh, and if you take with another region, you won't get a ball, but you get a, 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 a toric domain that has, that looks in, in a way like the symmetric region. And the idea is looking at billiards in the equilateral triangle. So sort of, because we know billiards are integrable, billiards in the, in the triangle are integrable, then you can play a game and you can find the first integral. And it's actually kind of hard to find, like in the literature, there's very little about like continuous billiards or, you know, billiards seen in this light. The billiards are usually seen as like a discrete dynamical system. Um, so even though it's kind of classical, you know, you have to kind of work hard to find these functions. And, and then there's also this thing about the reflection law, uh, which is not, you know, you have to understand that in terms of, of an actual smooth function. So. The, schematically, we think of it like this. So you have uh, this kinet kinetic uh, energy plus some reflection law, and then you have a commuting Hamiltonian. Um, so if you take one third of the real part of P cubed, where you see P is a complex number, that, that works, and that commutes with the reflection law. But that's not really smooth. So to apply the theorem, you have to actually find some potential, and then you have to twist the angular, the, the first integral also by the by some angular momentum. Um, and then after kind of a lot of work, you can prove that this, this, this works out. And we're generalizing this to a higher dimensions. Um, and in, so instead of the, of the hexagon, we have this thing called the permutahedron, which is a, a bas basically a polytope that generalizes the hexagon. Uh, so we we need now you know in higher dimensions it's a little harder because you need n integrals, um, so you need n functions. So it's it's a little bit harder to get that. But in this case we can get that. Um, and for the, with the permutahedron you get a ball. But if you take a symmetric region which is not a permutahedron you get another toric domain, which is not a ball. Uh, and to finish I just want to tell you about this latest result with my student Brian Fajera. Uh, which is that, so the, if you take the disk bundle of, the, of a hemisphere, that, that's symplectomorphic to a four-dimensional ball of capacity 2 pi, uh, and that gives rise to the computation of the gram of width of the disk bundle of S2 and also of the disk bundle of RP2. Uh, so they're both 2 pi. And the proof is the following. So consider the symplectomorphism uh, that 
is induced by the stereographic projection. So if you take the stereographic projection, that gives rise to a symplectomorphism of the cotangent bundles. Um, and then basically, you, yeah, you compute, you look at what the, the image of the disk bundle of the hemisphere is. So it's going to be some subset of the uh, tangent bundle of R2, where the norm is actually varying. It's not bounded by 1 anymore in general. And then you apply some action angle coordinates. Um, so it's a little tricky, but it's it's not too, too super hard, and you obtain the ball. Uh, and because it's just the hemisphere that will give rise to a, an embedding of the ball of radius 2 pi into the disk bundle of RP2, so, and, and they have the same volume. So that computes the Gromov width of uh, d star of RP2. And to compute the Gromov width of d star of S2, it's a little harder. Well, it's a lot harder because you actually need these ECH capacities. Um, so this was a hard calculation that my student did. Um, and then basically, that's that's the end of the proof. Um, so anyway, I hope that I gave you, you know, I hope to have given you uh, a general idea of the field. And I know I talked about a lot of results, but um, yeah, I hope that I inspired you to think that symplectic geometry is interesting and maybe we'll find some connections with, with your fields in the future. Well, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Vinicius. It was a beautiful talk, and um, we'd like to invite the audience to ask questions if they have any. And well, while people think about some question, I would like to ask you a question, which is yeah. in these final results where you um, used integrable system, you you always had a product of a, a simplex by something with symmetry, right? It was not yeah. really clear to me how this symmetry assumption uh, plays uh, a role in the... Yeah, so... Uh, quickly? Yeah, I can say that. They, they were not all that, but uh, most of them were. Um, so, yeah, there, I, I did... Like this this last example, uh, the, the, the disk bundle of, of S2, that didn't have, it wasn't written as a product with that symmetry. But most of the other ones were. And basically the reason that we were able to do that is because we were using, uh, it has to do with the proof. So basically the proof uh, used the, the integrability of standard billiards. I didn't say that very much, but basically if you have a Lagrangian product, the, the characteristic flow of that on the boundary, so the symplectic topology of that has to do with billiards on the boundary, but it's billiards in one of the convex sets whose reflection law is determined by the geometry of the other convex set. So there is something going on. And I, I kind of mentioned that if one of them, one of the factors is a disk, then that's going to be, the, the dynamics of that is going to be standard billiards on the other set. Mm -hmm. So if, like, if I take a square times a disk, the, the symplectic geometry of that will be related to billiards, like standard billiards on the, on the square. Mm -hmm. So if I want to, do if I want to apply this integrable systems technique, then what I the, the, the main idea is to look at the the function, the first integral of the billiard system. So you kind of have to work hard to find an actual smooth function uh, that will like replace the that will commute with the, the, the reflection law and replace the reflection law by something kind of continuous or smooth. Uh, and then when you get that, it, sure, you would get like basically the, the product of the disk of, of the of the square and the disk. But that, by some miraculous thing I don't completely understand, also works if you have if the second set has the symmetry of the of the square. Mm. So, which is kind of surprising because basically we've got a, a bunch of toric domains for things that are not for a bunch of dynamical systems that are not integrable. But so so, so the integrability of the standard uh, billiard on the, on the square will give will sh basically show that we have a bunch of integrable. Uh, a bunch of toric domains, even for non-integral Minkowski billiards, which are, you know, like if you take the, the product of the disk of the of the square with another set that just has the symmetry of the square, but it could be really crazy. Like you could take anything on the first quadrant and you just reflect it four times. Mm. And that will be a toric domain, like the product of the square with that. Uh, and we're using the same integrable systems that just comes from the disk. 
Uh, and for the equilateral triangle, the, uh, the symmetry that you get is this hexagonal uh, symmetry. So the hexagon is the simplest thing, but like if you take anything on the like on the on that slice on like you know the zero to uh, pi over three slice, and you project it six times, that's good enough. Mm. Um, so yeah, it it has to do with the proof. So it's it's a little um, I don't completely understand it. I, one of my you know big research research projects at the moment is to understand the relation between inter the integrability of these systems, like you know, especially billiard systems and dark domains, because there is like a one direction, but you know, try to understand whether we, I can prove non-integrability, for example, of, of billiard systems using symplectic geometry. Um, I don't, I don't quite understand that, but I, I think that that there's a chance that we, we would be able to say that eventually. Um, yeah, but somehow because like one billiard system being integrable proves that a lot, a huge class of products, Lagrangian products, are toric domains. That's kind of the moral of the story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Would anybody like uh, to ask another question? Yeah, I, I've got my hand raised. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't see it. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, so, uh, sorry, my question is not about toric stuff. You know, I just... Yeah. A consequence of not knowing many things is that I always ask the same question regardless of the context, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so here it is. Um, my 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 favorite um, uh, symplectic manifold with a well understood compact contact boundary, uh -huh. uh, given by the Milner vibration, right? Uh huh. You familiar with those? Yeah. There you go. So. Um, so the the in in that case the the for any dimension basically you pick the boundary is a, is a contact manifold with a, which is essentially the hop vibration on a given sphere restricted to maybe some 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 hypersurface yeah uh, right of of some some projective space so my my question is is has this been studied so have people been able to compute any of these capacities for the for the Milner for a typical Milner fiber. Well, so for the so the, if I understand correctly, I mean the the hop vibration, I for S three, um, that just uh, the this S three is just the boundary. It's just the boundary of the ball, the unit ball, or the stand yeah the standard ball. So in dimension, if if you're in dimension four, uh, the boundary of the ball is S3 and the characteristic flow there is the hop uh, flow. Yeah, but then you restrict it to a hypersurface. That's the, the, the way Milner's construction goes. Yeah. Is so you take some large C, so in your case, like C2. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's I, I'm not sure that's going to be very interesting, but let, let's give it a shot. Let, well, if, if you start with some CN plus one, right? Yeah. So in RN plus two, R2N plus two, you, you take a, sufficiently good polynomial so to take, take a polynomial with an isolated singularity right so this yeah. is going to give you an, an, an algebra and a fine variety with a singularity at the origin now uh -huh. take the link of a sphere intersecting this yeah intersecting this fellow right so so this will give you a 2n minus one manifold which is contact it turns uh -huh. out that all of these fellows are boundaries of the so-called Milner fibers. So these are the, the thing I just told you is the is the boundary of uh, a nice uh, uh, two mm. manifold, which is not only symplectic. In fact, in fact, it's it's scalar. Yeah. And, um, so, but 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 the fun of this is that if you start with say a weighted homogeneous polynomial. Right, which will have a, a, an isolated singularity at the origin. So this goes over to uh, weighted CPN under the hop vibration. So what you do recover is a situation uh, which is completely algebraic, right? You started with some polynomial, right? Mm -hmm. Carefully chosen, but if you start a good polynomial, uh, if you if if you were, uh, and then you get these these Kähler manifolds with a very well understood contact compact boundary in fact these are regular contact manifolds so all the rare orbits are uh smooth in their circles it's a circle bundle non-trivial but it's a circle bundle uh-huh um if you were to, to be able to compute these 
quantities and you know you know if, if god exists and is good then yeah. your capacities would be some would be completely determined by the coefficients of the polynomial uh -huh. right now because there exists a, a huge variety of these choices uh -huh. you you'd be, you'd get capacities in terms of these choices of coefficients but you would get fuckloads of them with very different topologies in principle uh -huh. that would give you a way to test some of these conjectures maybe some of them fail or if they are successful then you'll be able to show that they are successful in a huge number of cases yeah but but i mean what they're they're these are complicated they have complicated topology right not necessarily you tell me okay. which topology you like for instance uh, uh in in a typical case these manifolds are n uh n minus three connected for instance so if you so if you start with yeah. say uh Right, so 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 typically their first homologies are all trivial. Uh huh. They typically yeah. only have I think, homology you know, uh, at the middle, at the middle. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know basically uh, as as I kind of said at the beginning, what you you certainly can look at them. I, I don't know if anybody has looked. I don't think anybody has looked at at the embeddings of. Maybe someone has looked. I don't know, but it it turns out like you know if if you have topological obstructions for embeddings. That's usually not the kinds of embeddings that we are particularly interested. Like usually, we're interested in more quantitative. Um, like it, ba basically, you know, if you can take your your manifold and scale it down, and then you can embed. Then the question is like, how how much can you rescale it so that it can still embed? Because if it if it's a topological problem of embedding one thing into another, then it kind of doesn't have anything to do with a symplectic form. Then it's a um, so I guess you know the 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 question of like for example, yeah I guess you know the the gram of width can also can be interesting in a lot of examples. So maybe maybe for your uh, for the Milner manifolds, it would be interesting to compute their gram of width because you can you can always embed a little ball, well, and then you can yeah. always ask yeah what's the biggest ball you can embed? I mean um, I understand that size is an issue here. Yeah, but then the 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 the, the, the Kähler metric, which in particular uh -huh. will, will give you the symplectic structure, uh, yeah. uh, we're starting with is just the naive one, say the Fubini Studi metric on some yeah. weighted CPN. Uh -huh. Oh, you can change yeah. it in any way you want. You can rescale it. You can rescale it uh, non-homogeneously in various ways, essentially by varying connection on a line bundle. There's a lot uh -huh. of freedom. There's a lot of freedom there. To fuck with the metric in various ways in which you have total control, and then still discuss does this fit inside this other guy or not? So well, the reason I'm mentioning these examples is that there's a little bit of an entry barrier in which uh, uh, you have to understand how the input translates into the topology and Riemannian geometry of the output, right? But once you do that, mm -hmm. and 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 this is something I would be comfortable in discussing because I've I've gone through this. This is a machine to mass produce examples where, where you can do lots of stuff. So if you could, mm. for instance, compute any of your capacities, even the easier ones, even the ones that you, you, you feel you understand the yeah. most, for some of these examples, then, then you'd get huge families of examples with different mm. is in which these folks exist, which you can yeah. then mess around metrically in, in well-controlled ways. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, that, that's a, that's interesting. It's it's always a nice to have a huge family. Yeah, I'll think about this. It's maybe we can talk about that later. I'm happy it's, to explain to you with easy examples, yeah. just just so that one can draw and 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 and, and make this quantitative. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been very interesting on uh, very interested on these manifolds for completely different reasons, uh -huh. and I have found out that you can mass produce examples of <laughs> completely different things. Uh, uh, by, by by playing with these and then fiddling with the these degrees of freedom you have precisely metrically shrinking the fibers but while keeping the, you know there's, there's lots of stuff you can do there which is you have freedom but it's well controlled freedom you know exactly which yeah. parameters to tinker so that you know the things move in different ways uh -huh. uh, and since you have conjectures relating capacities like you say you know this capacity is either bigger than say or smaller than the volume, or this capacity always beats this other one, but I'm not too sure. Well, here's 10,000 examples in which a conjecture holds, and that's basically a proof, or 
you yeah. know, or here's yeah. one example, or, or can we solve this algebraic condition that to, to violate some of these conjectures? So this would give you powerful machinery to address some of these conjectures. That's that's uh -huh. basically my hint. Thanks. If, yeah, I'll definitely look into that. Yeah. If you remember this next week, then then we can chat in private. Uh, but I sounds good. I think you're gonna like the general setup. Yeah. Cool. Good. Thanks. Or maybe allocate a student or something. <laughs> yeah. No, students do the, the work anyway, so we they like to. Yeah, they do a lot of the hard work. Yeah, so we can allocate students just have a look at this if, if they feel like. Like I can I can give you a student on my own so they play they can play together or something. <laughs> okay. Do we have more questions for Vinicius?